Good afternoon, everyone. Um, before we begin, please turn off your cell phones or any electronic devices that might interfere. Um, again, good afternoon and welcome to this semester's first Two Rivers Reading Series presentation. Um, as of this semester, the Reading Series is completing its 12th year and we are already making plans for next year. We hope you'll join us again. Um, thank you to the English and Reading Departments and to the Faculty Development Committee for co-sponsoring today's event. Thank you also to the Technology Department for recording the presentation uh, so we can use it for classes, for online classes, and things like that for students who couldn't be here today. Um, today we are proud to continue our partnership with Penumbra Theater in St. Paul a theater with a national reputation for interpreting and producing August Wilson's plays, a theater company with whom August Wilson had a long-term intimate relationship. Joining us are four scholars who will help us read, understand, and appreciate one of this writer's plays. Dominic Taylor, Associate Artistic Director. Sarah Bellamy, Education Director, seated. James Craven, actor, and Lorea Carter, actor. Uh, one reminder, before I continue. Um, ARCC, uh, part of the Alumni Committee, uh, Faculty Development, and the English Division uh, are putting together an opportunity for students to have discount tickets to go see uh, to go see Ma Rainey's Black Bottom with the Guthrie on uh, February 27th at 1 o'clock. If you have an interest, contact Michael Wall or Scott Stanky for that great opportunity. So without further ado, on behalf of the English and Reading Departments here at Anuka Ramsey, please join me in welcoming this semester's visiting scholars, Dominic Taylor, Sarah Bellamy, James Craven, and Ray Carter. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to, what's going to happen today is we're going to read some scenes from the play, but also I'm going to try to put in context a little bit about August Wilson, a little bit about Penumbra, um, a little bit about Ma Rainey's Black Bottom to give you an idea, just for my curiosity. How many people have read Ma Rainey's Black Bottom? A few? A few? Oh, great. Oh, okay. Great. Then that's, I mean, I was, that's fabulous to know. Um, August Wilson is, um, was one of the great American playwrights of the 20th century. He passed away in 2005, but what he accomplished in his life, the seminal accomplishment is the, uh, the 10 plays that are the history cycle, or what they're called is the 20th century cycle. These plays take each decade of American, of the 20th century, and they frame African American history in each of those decades. We've been back here at Anoka Ramsey for the last couple of years with some of these, um, with some of our productions. Um, let me just mention something about the plays. The plays were not written in chronological order. He did not start in 1900 and go to the 1990s. They actually were written this is, uh, this was the second play written, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, but the first one that brought him to notoriety. The first play, I believe, was Jitney, which was about the 70s, but let me go chronologically so you get an idea about each of the decades. In 1900, the 1900s, there's a play called Gem of the Ocean. In 1910, the 1910s, that's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. In the 20s, and in this case, 1927, is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. The 1930s was Piano Lesson that we did at the theater two years ago, I believe, Piano Lesson, and we also came out here. Uh, the 1940s is a play called Seven Guitars. The 1950s is a play called Fences. Um, Fences won a Pulitzer Prize, as did Joe Turner's Come and Gone. So Joe Turner's Come and Gone won a Pulitzer, and Fences won a Pulitzer. Uh, 1960s play is Two Trains Running. The 1970s play, as I mentioned, was Jitney. The 1980s play was King Headley, and the 1990s play was Radio Golf, is with the play that we did last year, and we also visited out here. Um, August was a playwright who came to playwriting through poetry. He is a child of the Black Arts Movement. The Black Arts Movement was um, an artistic movement in which arts and culture were tied in with the Black Power Movement, and this is not about uh, a longer history lesson, but in earlier African American civil rights struggles moments in history, the arts were kind of outside. During the so-called Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro Movement of the 1920s, the arts were far outside. And in the 60s, the Black Arts Movement 
um, was the sister side or the brother side or the cultural side of the black power movement. And that's when August Wilson started writing his poetry in Pittsburgh. And he wrote a, a lot of poetry. He was influenced by uh, four particular muses, which I'm going to mention later. His poetry grew, and he came to St. Paul um, because of a friend, Claude Purdy, who brought him to St. Paul, and he actually sat in at Penumbra, and he watched our first production. In, uh, Penumbra Theater started in 1976. Oh, we're going into our 35th season. It's the only African-American theater in Minnesota. It is the premier African-American theater in the country. We operate, we, we produce in St. Paul. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is at the Guthrie, but we also end up uh, producing around the country. This Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was done first at the Arizona Theater Company. The radio golf that we did last year is going to be going to uh, Cleveland Playhouse and Indiana Rep next year. Uh, the, it also went to Pittsburgh. We bring plays from our home out throughout the country to show our signature style of production. Uh, and we go the other way too. We go from outside and we bring our plays finally home. Um, August got to see an early production and he wanted his plays to be done in a place that was that professional. And fortunately for us and for him and for everybody, uh, Penumbra has produced more of August Wilson plays than any other theater in the country. Um, the other thing about August Wilson's writing is that he actually models characters based on the company members. Uh, Penumbra Theater was founded by Luke Bellamy, but it's a company of actors and designers and performers and dramaturgs and an artist who make up Penumbra Theater Company. And August actually used a lot of company members as models for characters, characters in a variety of his plays. Um, August, as I mentioned, passed away in 2005, but he completed his cycle of 10 plays, which is a great accomplishment, actually. I think any time you would try to achieve something in your lifetime, you get to do it. It's something as grand as writing 10 plays for each decade of the 20th century. It is actually fabulous. Um, let me mention Ma Rainey's in particular. Ma Rainey's of the 20th century cycle is the only play that's set in Chicago. All the other plays are set in Pittsburgh. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom follows uh, a recording day in 1927 in March in Chicago. It is a very particular day about a very particular time when race operated in a unique way. One of the things about the play is that on this day, Ma Rainey is coming to record some out, some tracks for a new album, and a trumpeteer named Levy is, um, he wants to record his music. He's got some new music that he wants to play, so he wants to record his music, which is not Ma Rainey's music. Ma Rainey is uh, Madame Rainey. She's the queen of the blues. Ma Rainey, uh, Gertrude Pridgen, is an actual historical person, figure. She actually was a blues singer. You can buy her record, she's a blues singer. The play, and I always say this for historians or musicologists or whatever, is a composite of blues singers. It's a composite of blues singers. The other thing about the play is it actually is a, it captures Chicago at a particular time, and I think that's important. And I was just looking at something that August wrote, and this is actually in the, the play that you have, this is the setting from, uh, so this is set from Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, and this is as written by August, of course. Chicago in 1927 is a rough city, a bruising city, a city of millionaires and derelicts, gangsters and roughhouse dandies, whores and Irish grandmothers who move through its streets fingering long black rosaries. Somewhere, a man is wrestling with the taste of a woman in his cheek. Somewhere, a dog is barking. Somewhere, the moon has fallen through a window and broken into 30 pieces of silver. It is one o'clock in the afternoon. Secretaries are returning from their lunch. The noon mass at St. Anthony's is over and the priest is mumbling over his vestments while the altar boys practice their Latin. The procession of cattle cars through the stockyards continue undebated. The bus boys in Max Place are cleaning away the last of the corned beef and cabbage on the city's south side. Sleepy-eyed Negroes move lazily toward the small cold water flats and rented rooms to await the onslaught of night which will find them crowded in the bars and juke joints, both dazed and dazzling in the rapport with life. It is with these Negroes that our concern lies most heavily, their values, their attitudes, and particularly their music, which I think is a, is a great introduction into this world because we're about to enter this blues music or this blues, um, this blues recording session. One of the things I have to always say about the blues, and I say this constantly, is that the blues is not a sad music. 
Blues is secular music, but it's not sad music. It's actually triumphant because the human spirit always wins. Blues never lets tragedy have the last note. So blues is always a triumphant music, even when at the end of the blues song, you know, your dog leaves you, your wife leaves you, your car is broken, you don't have any money, but at the end, the note is, I'm gonna go on and I'm gonna try tomorrow. I'm gonna see what tomorrow brings. I got one more quarter in my pocket to let me go figure out something else. So the blues is, is never a down music. One of the things that's interesting about this moment is that the blues also is a cultural artifact. And in the, the setting of this play in the 1920s, this is the beginning of the big recording move and race records are big and all these kind of things. Because blues, as somebody says, blues are as old as human beings, you know? <laughs> and so um, whether they were in field hollers or work songs or other kind of musical forms, people were singing the blues, but we didn't record the blues until the early 20th century, but we didn't have recording mechanisms. Within the context of this, Ma Rainey is engaged in this recording moment, and it is really important that she gets this recording done on this day. The other thing which is important about the 1920s, and you know this, America was mired in its racist moment, its racist past. The 1920s had segregated cars everywhere, the blacks and whites operated in two separate worlds. People will argue that we still do, but then it was a legal thing, like you legally had it not stay in a hotel, or you couldn't ride the car, or you had black and white water fountains. The black codes emerged, as most of you know, at the end of Reconstruction, so the 20th century was a fight going forward about how, these, how race operated in America. And in this world, and in this world, Ma knows that she has a little bit of power, because she can come into this place and make this record, but Ma doesn't have ultimate power. She's not like, um, you know, Aretha Franklin today, who can go jump on a jet and fly across the world and do whatever Aretha feels. I, don't, I know Aretha's sick and I love Aretha, but I don't know what she's doing today. But I'm saying that she didn't have all of those things. So she understood that within the social structures or the governmental structures, they actually were social structures, the governance structures that we had, she had a place, but she still had wanted to maintain her power. And one of the important things is how August Wilson used her in this power relationship. Um, what I want, to, for you to hear first, I actually want uh, Jim and Luria to read this scene. Luria's gonna be reading Ma, Jim is gonna be reading Cutler. And this is just a scene in the recording studio. And it's just to, uh, you know, continue to set this world. So, this is Ma. In this scene, basically, um, Ma was just about to record a song and she wanted her Coca-Cola that was supposed to be there because her manager knows, and it's not there, so they have to break go get the Coca-Colas, and she has a one-on-one -on -one cup. <clears throat> I've been doing this a long time, ever since I was a little girl. I don't care what nobody else do. That's what get me so mad with Urban. White folks try to be put out with you all the time. Too cheap to buy me a Coca-Cola. I let them know it though. Ma don't stand for no shit. Wanna take my voice and trap it in them fancy boxes with them buttons and dials, and then too cheap to buy me a Coca-Cola? And it don't cost but a nickel a bottle. Yeah, I know what you mean about that. They don't care nothing about me. All they want is my voice. Well, I didn't learn that. And they gonna treat me like I wanna be treated, no matter how much it hurt them. They back there now calling me all kinds of names, calling me everything but a child of God. But they can't do nothing else. They ain't got what they wanted yet. As soon as they get my voice on them recording machines, then as if I'm some sort of whore and they roll over and put their pants on. Ain't got no use for me then. I know what I'm talking about. You watch, Urban right up there with the rest of them. He don't care nothing about me either. He been my manager for six years, always talking about sticking together. And the only time he had me in his house was the same for some of his friends. I know how they do. If you call it, you can make some money, then you all right with them. Otherwise, you're just a dog in the alley. I'd have made this company more money and with my records than any other record recording artist they got put together. And they want to balk about what this session is costing them. I don't see where it's costing them all what they say it is. It ain't. important about 
about that scene. And, and I do think it's that, that Ma is really aware of her position. She, and, it's, and it's a strange thing to think of how we, in human beings, Americans, whatever, fill in the blank, you might not want to call yourself American, how we think that we are ultimately like free and we can do whatever we want to. I think that it's really interesting to watch a character say that within this moment, I know that I have some power. I have, I have a certain power in this recording studio. But as soon as they get my voice on that, on that machine and they put them dials down, they got nothing else to do with me. And the notion that how you can maximize your potential within that power relationship is always really interesting to think of how, you, how one deals with that. That's one of the things which is really important about August Wilson, this is just a good writing thing, is that the universal does come from the specific. The more specific you make something, and, and, and this is the thing which is about this play. Ma Rainey is a woman who's recording in Chicago, but she's from the South. So she really has a relationship from the South to the North. And you can see that, not just in her language, but you can see that in her relation with Urban and Sturman. Also the fact that she doesn't have to record this if she chooses not to. She can go back to the South if she wants to. She doesn't have to be in this recording studio. Because records weren't what you, what you think they are even today. Actually, even today, they're not what you think they are. Because anybody who is a, a recording artist will tell you they make more money touring than they do recording the music. So that, it, so that even the notion of being a recording star is, is one of these, one of these uh, bad questions. I do think that one of the other things you want to hold on to is where this woman sits. Because she's not a man in this recording studio. She's a woman in the 1920s, which is really important. And I think that, you know, there are all these apocryphal stories. Well, maybe they're not apocryphal stories, they're actual stories. But you have to be tough to be a woman who's in charge of your band. You have to be tough to be a woman who's a CEO today. I mean, any woman who's, and of course, people use all these nasty euphemisms when referencing these women occasionally because they're like whatever they are. But you know that it's not a man's world. I'm not even remotely purporting. But within these positions of power, within these prescribed notions, the person who owns the recording studio is sturdy. The person who's your manager is urban. There are these other things, you know, so that this woman doesn't have the ultimate power, but she's got power for this moment. You know, I, I think that's one of those things that when you think about how tough this woman is. Additionally, there's this other add-on to this tough lady is her sexuality. So people who read the play, um, Jim, Jim Craven plays Cutler in the play, and uh, Maria plays Dusty May in the play. Dusty May is a character who is Ma's girlfriend in the play. Or uh, her friend, you know, her dad probably shouldn't call her girlfriend, her, her friend plus, you know. But I, I think that the sexuality question is also a great question for us to deal with as an audience. I mean, one of the things that's, that's interesting about, um, not just the black arts movement, but black, the black arts movement is where August Wilson grew from but also black life in general, how we deal with homophobia, how we deal with uh, lesbianism, how we deal with sexuality in all of its guises, is an interesting thing for us to have a discussion about. And one of the great things about theater is you could enter this space where these wonderful actors go on stage with the director and designers and lights and costumes and all that stuff, and this thing comes, alive, comes to life in so many ways that you get to see not just the play that you read on the paper, but you just get to see these human beings on really good to see these human beings. I, I, um, I probably should say this one thing uh, about this production, and hopefully we'll all go see it on the 27th. Lou Bellamy, the director, and these actors have had such an intimate relationship with August Wilson's work that they know the work. Um, I was gonna say backwards and forwards, I was trying to figure out about a better metaphor. But they know the work so well. Um, Lou Bellamy and Penumbra produced August 1st play, Black Bart and the Sacred Hill. It's a play that nobody is going to do again. I don't think anybody, I could be wrong, I don't think Constanza Romero ever wants that play to see the light of the day. It was an early play. It was based on the Lysistrata myth, and it was a musical. Um, but it was the play that started this playwright going forward. Um, Jim is aware, I mean, as most of the um, company members who have been here for a while, on how August shaped these plays around characters who are in the company. Like these characters grew from readings with these company members and then um, August took these plays and, and went somewhere else. Ma Rainey's is important for August's um, oeuvre. There you go. Because this is the play which brought him to national attention. 
This is a play that was done on Broadway in 1985. This is the play where after its production, he no longer was August Wilson, guy writing plays in the Twin Cities. He was August Wilson, you know, major American author. You know, he became this other thing. Anytime you're sitting on Broadway, you become this major American. You become this other thing. Um, which is just, you know, for your information. I do want, uh, uh, how many people are in theater, or in theater, how many people do shows? Oh, God bless you, you're all so smart. I have, <laughs> I should have one. Oh, so what do you do with it? No, because I have, whatever. I teach at the University of Minnesota, and I've been doing this too long. Sometimes my students will ask me, what about a life in theater, and you know, is it a good thing to be in theater? And I always, it depends on the day of the week. Sometimes I'm like, absolutely not. Other times I'm like, yes, it's great. But um, what I actually wanted the actors to talk to really quickly was a process question, like how they, um, I'll ask Jim to do it first, how they dealt with either Lou or this play or the process of finding, of making a role or owning this role or any of that stuff. Okay, first off, I gotta say this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a guy, I've been in the theater for uh, uh, almost uh, 45 years. Uh, this is my life. Uh, this is all I know how to do, and I'm broke. So, <laughs> that's what you need to know about the theater. Um, when I go into a production, um, I, I'm, uh, I generally only work with very few people. The person that I like to work with the most is Lou Bellamy. And that's because uh, with Lou, I enter into an agreement with him by first uh, discussing the play with him, reading it over, and uh, we come to an agreement of what we think the kid, what the play is about, and how we want to, uh, where we want the play to go, and where we want it to end up, and then we go about the process of making that happen. That's the agreement I have with him. The agreement I have with my fellow actors during the rehearsal process and the performance process is that we come to uh, um, an agreement, again, about how is the best way to present these characters in, um, in a realistic way, and yet still have um, um, respect and integrity for each other when we're doing it. Because sometimes we have to do some pretty nasty things to each other. But we come to an agreement about how that is, so we can all, all walk away as friends. But um, now, uh, to go back again. So my process is very simple. Um, I um, I uh, uh, make an agreement with Lou, make an agreement with the director about where we want to go with the character, and then I set about uh, 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 enacting and uh, keeping that agreement. Um, and within the context of the show, um, as I said before in the last class that was in here, Maria and I are on stage together, and we don't even have a scene together. We don't even talk to each other, but we have a relationship on stage that she initiated uh, because she realized within the context of her character being, being uh, uh, she doesn't like the word opportunistic, but I'll use it, an opportunistic woman, <laughs> an opportunistic woman looking for, looking for the next, uh, uh, whatever the next, uh, next new ticket is to the, to the future. She walks past my character and just kind of um, eyeballs me for a second to see if I'm interested in it. I turn away from that because, not because she's not attractive, which you can see that Marie is, but uh, Ma would kick my ass if I did <laughs> if I flirted with her, so I just turn away from that because I'm more afraid of what Ma can do to me than what uh, Dusty May can give me. So that's the reason I have here. And, and, uh... And I do think, one, one of the things that's, that's um, Jim mentioned it, but he doesn't, like each of the characters have their own trajectory. Like I do say that when you look at Ma Rainey's, it is about leaving, coming into this place, let me come into this space, and he wants to record his song. But Cutler wants to record this, Cutler wants to record Ma Rainey's songs. Not because Cutler, and I'm speaking for Jim right now, not because Cutler's in Ma, love with Ma Rainey, but because Cutler needs that money to go somewhere else, he's like, I want to get paid in cash. He doesn't want to check. He's there for the job. I hate to say it, it's, it's one of those characters that I totally, um, I work at the University of Minnesota, and I'm not saying that I don't love working at the University of Minnesota, but I know I go to work every day because I need that check. 
So I'm not, so that's like, I can totally relate to that character in so many ways. But August Wilson has, his characters each have their own trajectory. Levy is a character who believes in art, or art is his, his primary thing. Like, he's an artist, so he thinks that matters. And I, I hate to say it, being in the theater for so long, you know, talent and art mean absolutely nothing. It's just something else. And that's a terrible thing to say. But talent and art aren't going to be enough, particularly if you don't have a community with you. And that's where his character is flawed. That's where his character has, has problems. And also not understanding the room that he's in. He enters not his recording session, he enters Ma Rainey's recording session. He's part of the band. He's not the person who is in front of the band. Um, uh, somebody emailed a question about Dusty May, and I do want Loria to talk about how she makes a character, but I do think that Dusty May is a character that people <coughs> wonder about. Like, you know, what is the function of Dusty May in the play? So if you just talk about either how you approach a character or who Dusty May is. Well, uh, August Wilson, he describes her as a young, dark-skinned woman whose greatest asset is her sensual energy, which seems to flow from her. She's dressed in a canary yellow dress with a fur jacket. So <clears throat> I was just given that, and I'm beginning in the theater business for the last three years. This is my second August Wilson play that I've been in. And my other character was Grace. And there's similarities in the Wilson women, and I'm fascinated with the Wilson women. So when I when I say Wilson women, I'm talking about the ten plays. I've read them all, I've dissected them all, and when I start my process, I kind of find out where Desi May lies within all of these women, and I navigate from there. Um, she's my gal. She. I don't like to say opportunistic because I think that her motive is more of a survival than just being, you know, greedy or a gold digger, but those things are appealing to her. She likes the life of traveling and all these fancy clothes and these, she's fascinated with music, so she flirts with color. And I have a very minimal dialogue, but my presence is known in the show because the director has given us a lot of freedom and opportunity just to be ourselves and have these little side stories where I would go, you know, flirt with Cutler or I'm looking at Toledo or I'm arguing with, you know, the stuttering nephew. I have a scene with Levy, so I'm not 100% a lesbian. I'm bisexual in mm -hmm. this play. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. Yeah. That's basically. No. But I do think, I do think that the function of Decimate now that, you know, when Levy just said that, I, I, I always posit this thing about um, <clears throat> homosexuality or how homophobia operates in the black community is one of these conversations that you can have around um, my range black black. But also, the bisexuality makes the question of sexuality, period, like, like what is that question? Like, what, what is the value of sexuality? In the, in the character of Dusty May, Dusty May uses her sexuality um, for uh, potential opportunity. But that can't be the only function of a human being, sexuality. Or, or is sexuality in some way moved somewhere else? Like, it doesn't really matter who you sleep with. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, you know, what you do for this moment. It's an interesting kind of question. And I do, you know, there's a, there's this, uh, a, a professor recently passed, Oscar Brockett, whatever he, some of you probably have a Brockett textbook. And, um, and he used to be the godfather of this Western way of learning theater and all this stuff. But he said once, I, I heard him speak to somebody else, and he said, when you get right back to it, it's framing questions. It's what the, he claimed what the ancient Greeks did. But it's like framing questions for the audience to view. And I always think that's kind of an interesting thing. I do know that theater is a viewing place. But the fact that what it allows you to do, it doesn't, it, the, the reason why I think that it's important that Brock said it is because it doesn't give you any answers. One of my, one of my uh, pet peeves about August Wilson is that people go to an August Wilson play in Black History Month and they think they have figured out something about black people in America in the 1920s. And they're like, I figured out, I don't know what. I mean, because I don't know what you figured out. I do know that this play allows you a bunch of questions and a bunch of things to think about, but I don't know what you figured out, you know? And so that's why I'm always like, the theater doesn't let you figure out anything. The theater just actually, hopefully, good theater, just let you keep asking questions of yourself and hopefully you can apply those questions that you ask of yourself into, like, uh, into your life or into real life applications in some way. Um, I do want you to ask questions and I do want you to hear this um, monologue, the uh, 
Reverend Gates, My Love by Jim. Uh, but the, the, the other thing which I think is um, unbelievably important for you to remember, when you come to this play, or when you come to any piece of drama, you do not enter it from the person who's sitting next to you's location. You enter it from your space. I mean, one of the things, all great plays, usually allow audiences multiple points of entry. And in this play, that's where the blues music is a useful thing. Because people are like, I know music, I love music, I can listen to music. But it still doesn't let you position yourself in the same place as the person who's sitting next to you. So you're not listening to music in the same way. So one of the things that's always a challenge is like, occasionally people are like, well, why do you use like, why do black people view this play one way, other people view this play another way? People who are immigrants view this play another way. It's like, oh, I've never seen black American drama in this way. I always say you come to the play from wherever you are, from wherever you are, and deal with the play on its own terms. Within the first 10 minutes of any good play, and in this play it happens as well, you learn everything that you're gonna see go forward. So you learn who these bandmates are, you learn when Levy comes into the place and he puts on his shoes, and that putting on the shoes means that he's gonna make great music that day. Then when Ma enters, there's never any doubt that it's her room and that she's supposed to record her songs. So that early on, you know that, that all these balls that are up in the air that are gonna be juggled, you're gonna see them for the rest of the play. Of course, there are things that are surprising, but I also think that you cannot act as if you are either above the play or beneath the play. You enter from wherever you are. And, that's, and it's always a good place. It's actually very democratic. That's one of the things about theater. Very different. Okay. So let me. Oh, the last thing before I go to Reverend Gates. August Wilson had four muses. Blues is one of his muses. The author Borges was one of his muses. Amiri Baraka was one of his muses. And uh, Romare Bearden. I don't know why I keep forgetting Romare Bearden today. Romare Bearden was his fourth muse. Romare Bearden is a collage artist of, uh, after the Harlem Renaissance. Um, Romer Bearden's image was uh, the inspiration for Piano Lesson, which is a play that was set in the 30s, just after this one. And I believe that is all the stuff that I wanted to say about that. Um, oh, and the politics of the play, we're gonna talk about in a second. But I'd like you to hear the Reverend Gates monologue for time and time. As I had said last time, um, um, there's other people that are talking to me. I'm having a conversation with during the context of when I do this speech. Sometimes when I have to edit this thing in my head as I go along, edit them out. So I'm just talking to you guys. Um, one thing I have to pair, uh, uh, kind of do a little setup on this thing. Uh, uh, the conversation is about part of the conversation is about whether Ma is an actual crossover star and how powerful she is, um, how much power she has in the white community. Uh, being a crossover star, she's in a uh, white recording studio making this record, and so we're going to assume that she's going to, you know, sell it not just to a black audience, but she's also going to sell it to a white audience. So Cutler um, has to point out to uh, Levy, makes that kind of alludes to that that she has a lot of power, and tell her that uh, that the uh, white folks, uh, the white man, don't care nothing about Ma. It's the colored folks that made a Ma star. White folks don't care nothing about who she is, what kind of music she makes. See now, um, I'm going to tell you something. See this Reverend Gates. You know Reverend Gates. Reverend Gates. You know what I'm talking about. You're talking about Reverend Gates. All right. We'll see now. I'm going to show you how this goes. With white folks don't care nothing about who or what you is. Reverend Gates was coming from Tallahassee to Atlanta. He was going to see his sister, who was sick at the time with consumption. The train came up through Thomasville, then past Moultrie and it stopped in this little town called Sigsby. Reverend Gates, get off the train there. He get off the train, figured that he'd check the schedule to be sure that he arrived in time for somebody to pick him up. While he's checking the schedule, it came upon him that he had to go to the bathroom. Now they ain't had no colored restrooms at the station. The only colored restroom is an outhouse that got sitting way back about 200 yards or so from the station. So he's in the outhouse. And the train go off and leave him there. Now see, he don't know nothing about this town. He ain't never been there before. In fact, he ain't even heard of it before. So 
So he's standing there trying to figure out what he's gonna do. Where this train done left him in this strange town. And he's trying to figure out what he's gonna do when he notices that it's getting dark. I mean, he can see when the sun's getting low in the sky. He's trying to figure out what he's gonna do when he notices a couple of white fellas standing across the street from the station. Now they're just standing there watching. Then two or three more come up and join the other ones. Now he don't know what's getting in these fellas' minds. So he commenced to walk, and he don't know where he's going. He's just walking down the railroad tracks when he heard him call out to him, hey, nigga. <laughs> you see, just like that. Hey, nigga. And he kept walking. Well, they called him some more, and he kept on walking. Then he heard a gunshot when somebody done fired a gun in the air. Well, he stopped walking then, you know. They crowd around him. These gang of men made a circle around him. And he's standing there, you understand, with a cross around his neck like the preachers wear. Had his little Bible what he carried with him all the time. So he's standing there. And one of them asked him who he is. And he told him he's Reverend Gates. He's going to meet his sister who was sick and the train went off and left him. And they said, yeah, nigga, but can you dance? Well, he looked at him and commenced to dancing. One of them reached up and tore that cross from his neck. Told him he was committing heresy by dancing on the cross in the Bible. They took his Bible and tore that up. Had him dance until they got tired of watching him. That's the only way he got out of their lives was to dance. They ain't even had no respect for a man of God. They want to make him into a clown. Now, Reverend Gates sat right in my house and told me that story from his own mouth. So, no, the white man don't care nothing about my Rainey. She's just another nigga that they can use to make some money. I didn't say this earlier, I said this before. I mean, that monologue is really touching and it, and it does all this stuff. But I was talking to a group of students once and I can't believe how plays have present day resonance. I think that Ter Terrell Owens, I don't know if you know who Terrell Owens is. Terrell Owens is a wide receiver. He plays, he plays right now for the Cincinnati Bengals. And when he was with the San Francisco 49ers, he said, they don't love Terrell Owens. They love that I can catch this ball. And when I start dropping this ball, they ain't gonna love Terrell. And so when I, when I, when Terrell said that, I, you know, it's one of these things like, Terrell Owens doesn't go to theater. I mean, maybe he does, I don't know. It's like, did he see my brain? And come out with this like idea? But my only point is that it is not an idea that's outside of its time. It's not, it's not an idea that's stuck in 1927. It's actually <laughs> one of those ideas that's, you know, more present than I wish it were. Anyway, at, the, at that point, but before I prattle on some more, I wanted to get some questions in from you. People who've read the play, people who haven't read the play, people who have questions about theater, making theater, anything. Um, yeah, I was going to say anything within this point where I can help you. Nothing but love. Yeah. Another question. What method do you use to remember your lines as an actor when you get like a, a difficult dialect to use? It's just rope. Doing it over and over and over and over again. Repetition. Repetition. And I and I do and I do an auto, but I think it also helps to do it in space. I think it's oh, yeah. I think it's hard if you're just if, if you this is I'm not acting anymore, but back in the good old days. I used to tell people that it's hard for me to learn lines before blocking starts. Because then I'm aware of, you know, I'm here, I did it, I'm talking to her. So that that rope thing, you end up doing it in your apartment, like your spatial relationship to the other actor. And that's just, I mean, when I say road, that just means to say that's how you remember the words. But words are words. You can read words. You can read words a million times. You have to give the meaning, so consequently you need the, not only the space, but you need the person that you talk to to be there. So you actually need to talk and relate to the person. If, if I can just add, these actors, Wilson plays, I'm sure if you guys have read them, you'll see that he repeats lines over and over and over again within monologues. So you get a monologue that's like two pages long, and he'll say the same three lines within that monologue. 
So these actors have mastered a particular kind of way of working and approaching work. It's really remarkable because it's hard. I've seen younger actors, you know, that are just coming up in the in the work, trying to memorize these monologues, and you could actually see them kind of going along and they're da -da -da -da, and then they turn the page in their head, and you could actually see their head go like this while they're turning the page to continue with the monologue. So it's it's pretty amazing, and I think. Um, a lesser skilled actor could find themselves lost very easily inside of an August Wilson monologue for that reason. And I do, and I, this is just, this is not an acting class at all, but one of the things that I think is really important is you've got to stay in the moment. I mean, one of the things which kills me, and it's great that at number we get five weeks of rehearsal, or four and a half weeks of rehearsal. I used to rehearse in New York, and actors used to, I mean, I used to work in New York, used to live in New York. And it used to drive me crazy because actors would get their beats and their through lines, like they would know what they were supposed to say, and they would do the same thing every night. And you'd be like, you've got to be in that moment. Because if you're not in that moment, then it's just false. It looks like, it looks like it's a small world after all at Disneyland. I mean, you've got to be in that moment every night. There was a night I was directing a show, and a woman had missed her mark, and another woman was falling back on her, and she wasn't going to, I didn't think she was going to catch her. Because she had got it so locked in, like, I say this line here, and this is what happened. You want to make sure that you stay in the moment. And when you watch this production, you can, I don't want to say that the play is different every night, but what happens with those bodies on stage is, they are those characters. So that if something, you know, happens, you know, uh, you know, a purse break, a shoe come off or whatever, they're in their characters and they're not thrown. So you've got to make sure that you own that character. You just don't own the lines. You've got to own who that character is fully. And August allows you that. Uh, other questions? Questions? Yes, sir. I, I've got a, uh, a craft and a dusty made question all rolled up into one. Um, I read that uh, Ms. Steele was practicing cursing at home because it was so outside of, of who she is when she's playing my and her experience. And I'm wondering if um, the, to get into what I'm going to call Dusty May's pragmatic attitude rather than uh, opportunistic, but it, I'm assuming that you are different in that way, that is. How do you get to a place where you're comfortable feeling what some of us might think of as you know, kind of uncomfortable or, or a slimy, you know, that, that change in personality to make that your own? What's interesting is my mom seen it for the first time on um, Saturday, and she was like, that was still you. And I'm like, Really? I was like, I don't like flirt with all these men all the time. And she's like, no, your demeanor, the way you walk, you may have been saying these words, you may have countrified your voice, but that's still you. So if you kind of start with that basic, put yourself in your character, then everything else just seems to come. You know, I get the blocking, I have the words, I have the interactions with people. And I would say it's me times like 50. You know, I'm not my actual self, but there's a lot of parts of me that makes Desi easier to come through. And then for instance, like with scenes with Ma, I almost forget that there is this lesbian little interaction because it's so um, indirect and it's really tasteful. You know, it's not, it could have gone all these other ways and the way we decided to play it, it really works. And it's more beautiful than, you know, disgusting or to uh, growth, you know, yeah. or anything like yeah. that. So. I mean, and also, can I say something yeah. about that? I, 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 I always find it really curious that, that you, you use, you say, say a word, homosexual, lesbian, but something like that, and people all of a sudden really think that it's some, some other thing, like some, some alien, some, some, some <coughs> monstrous thing right, right there. But you know, I, I, like Dominic, I lived in New York. I also lived in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and I lived in Minneapolis. You know, I can be on a bus anywhere or anywhere in public, in a restaurant, whatever. I don't know if there's lesbians or homosexuals or whatever sitting next to me, ever. These are just people walking around in life. You know, they're a part of our, they're a part of the every community, and they're everywhere in the world. And it's just that while you're watching this particular play, you're seeing two, two people of that uh, persuasion together for that moment of time, you know, which you may not see unless you were 
one, you know, in that position. One of the things that I love about August writing, though, is he gives, he gives each character opportunity to engage in the notion of power predicated on what their strengths are. And, I mean, Dusty May uses her sexuality as a strength to get what she wants. Sylvester uses his kinship relationship, the fact that he's a nephew. You know, uh, um, Toledo uses his intelligence to try to, you know, garner favor to deal with what he deals with. I mean, I, like I said, Levy does the art thing. I always think it's really interesting, but we don't, we don't embrace that as human being, but it's the truth that every time I've ever worked on a show, I always get fascinated on how complicated we are <coughs> and how many different sides there are. But one of the things that, that is in all of us is we do want something, <laughs> and we try to figure out what is our strength to get this thing that we want. And then it becomes really, and this is what August Wilson actually is a really great writer. So whatever that strength is, whatever that, that strength is that these characters use, each of these characters have a different strength to get what they want. Uh, one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a believer in the idea that there's social change, and I believe that's very much what Melinda is about. Um, so how does this production Uh, yeah, do you want to well, it briefly, because we're running out of time, yes. but I think, you know, there are so few authentic representations of black culture, black life, um, that's available to us in, in America, even in the contemporary realm. So I think what we're doing is showing a, a picture that is authentic to the culture because the people that have created it are of the culture. And so you get this sort of undiluted look at a moment, an historical moment, and we kind of get to intervene in the forces of history that would have written these people out of history in a certain kind of way. And they get an opportunity to speak. Um, and it's uninterrupted, and it's unmediated, and I think when you put proper contextualization around it, when you get an opportunity to talk to um, directors, dramaturgs, actors, when you can read the study guide, um, you realize that it allows you a window into a much bigger exploration of history. And so all of our plays give us an opportunity to teach around that. And I think that's how we look at theater as a springboard for further conversation. It doesn't end inside the theater. It can. You can come and have an amazing experience, but if you want to do that extra work and learn more, we try to give you as many tools as possible to do that. And, and I do think, I mean, what I was going to say is, I actually think all theater does social change if it's done well. Yes. And one of the things about it is, there is no solution-based thing. But what you do is you get this window into the world in which hopefully there can be a frame where you can have open and honest conversations about all these themes and all these ideas. And that's where the contextual revelation works. Anyway, thank you all. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your